let's get started right away. Last week, we um, left off speaking on adultery, speaking about adultery, and the Lord took us into some really, really um, intriguing areas, <laughs> right? <laughs> intriguing areas, right? We saw that um, according to Jesus, adultery is not a, primarily about sex, but it is about being unfaithful to the covenant of marriage, okay? He said, if a man lost in his heart after a woman, right? He has already, commi he has, he has already committed adultery in his heart with that woman, right? They didn't do anything yet physically. He just look and lust. And he has already committed adultery. So that teaches us that adultery is about breaking the covenant, being unfaithful to the covenant of marriage. Okay. And we saw last week that the actual physical act is the consummation of the adultery. Just like um, in a marriage, uh, when you go through that ceremony and you exchange vows and the minister pronounces you husband and wife, you have entered into the covenant of marriage. And then later on, subsequent to that, when you engage in physical intercourse, that's when you consummate the marriage. You bring it to completion and fulfillment. Adultery works the same way. You can be in adultery uh, without having any physical interaction with the person, right? The physical interaction is a consummation of the adultery. We saw that last week. We saw that because that's the meaning of adultery, people can be in an adulterous situation without even knowing it, ignorant adultery, right? We looked at two specific examples, right? Wives who have replaced their husband with their children, more specifically with the son, right? And um, the place in their heart that the, the husband was supposed to occupy, the son now occupies that spot, ignorantly innocently there is no hint of incest or anything sexual but the fact is that the the place in that woman's life in her heart that her husband is supposed to occupy the marriage is broken down and now the son is occupying that spot that's an adulterous relationship because the covenant is broken and and what god has put together let not man put asunder so when a wife a woman a mother puts her son before her husband or children, for that matter, before her husband, the children are coming between the spouses, right? And, and literally putting apart what God has put together. So it's an adulterous relationship. The converse of that now is when that young man grows up, because he has been groomed by his mother to have that type of adulterous situation going on, again, without any type of incest or sexual connotation, nothing like that. It's innocent, it's ignorant, right? It's just the, the being unfaithful to the covenant, breaking the covenant, right? He grows up in that type of situation with his mother. He gets married now, and guess what? He is going to consistently put his mother before his wife because he doesn't know any better. You see, he's ignorant. And so he perpetuates that adulterous relationship with his mom. And so just as a woman, a wife, would not feel good knowing that her husband is putting his mother before her, right? It feels disrespectful, abusive, wrong, and it is all these things. That's exactly the same situation with a woman, a wife, a mother putting her children before her husband. Same thing. In both cases, the person is elevating the parent-child relationship higher than the husband-wife relationship. It is wrong in both situations, both cases, it is wrong. Okay? Um, I, I also made the distinction that whereas a, a woman, a wife, a mother ought not to put her children before her husband. The husband comes first, always. Okay? That is an absolute fact. It's a biblical truth. That's proper um, um, kingdom protocol, as it were. Right? That's divine order. Right? And even though that is true, there is there's, there's a, a subtle difference uh, where... Um, you're not supposed to put your children before your spouse, but you are supposed to put your children before yourself. <laughs> See, that's the difference. We are, as parents, we are supposed to put our children before ourselves, but not before our spouses. So there's a difference. It's a very delicate difference, but it makes all the difference in keeping divine order in the family. Okay, so all that was last week. So I just repeat that here to bring us up to date on where we are right now, right? I urge you, if you have not done so as yet, please go watch last week's video. Today, we want to start talking about how to cultivate an adultery-free marriage, right? How to um, put into practice habits, mindsets, ideologies that would 
um, cultivate a victorious and successful marriage relationship? How do we do that, right? And so I've termed it understanding the office of the husband and wife, understanding the office, right? So we're going to start here and we're going to end up here with understanding the office, right? And it's going to be an exciting journey. The husband, according to the Bible, cultivate and protect the garden. That's the mandate that God gave to Adam even before Eve was brought from, from within him. Eve was still inside of him. Her body wasn't yet formed and God gave Adam that mandate, cultivate and protect the garden, okay? Um. When Eve was created, he said she's now a help meet, right? The word meet means suitable, qualified, or fitting. Help assistant, okay? And that word help, that's the same word that is used of God's divine help toward mankind. That would help. And so we see that when God gave Eve to Adam, what he was in fact doing is giving Adam divine help in a human package. Divine help in a human package. That's what a wife is to a husband, divine help, godly help in the form of a human being. Oh, glory to God, <laughs> right? And I've found that when we as, as married people, when we understand our own office and the office of our spouses, things go much better. You see, Dr. Miles Monroe always says that if you don't understand the purpose of a thing, then the abuse of that thing is, 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 is definitely going to happen. You've got to understand purpose, purpose, purpose. He was big on teaching on purpose and destiny. And if you don't understand the purpose of a marriage, if you don't understand your role in a marriage, your wife's or your husband's role in the marriage, abuse is going to be inevitable. It will be inevitable. All right. So that's what we want to look at today. The purpose. So when God gave Adam that mandate, cultivate and protect the garden, Adam was supposed to cultivate his vertical and horizontal relationships. He was supposed to seek from God how to cultivate and how to protect the garden. Adam did not do that from, from my own understanding. When I look at the Bible and I see the sequence of events, to me, Adam lapsed and he was not doing that because if he did that, and if he sought God on specifically how to cultivate and protect the garden, then I believe God would have specifically told him. He would have given specific answers to specific questions. You see, Adam did not ask specific questions, so God couldn't give him specific answers. Remember, God gave human beings dominion over the planet. He said, go for it, control. You're in charge, you govern, you know, rule, you know, do, do as you will. You know, it's, it, I, I give you that authority. I give you that uh, ability and that authority. I give you dominion. Go ahead and rule, right? So it was up to Adam to seek God and how to cultivate. And if he did that, I believe God would have specifically tell him, watch for that serpent. <laughs> watch for that serpent. You know, he's going to come and cause some problems. And Adam would have known how to protect the garden. He didn't do that, and the serpent was able to come in, of course, under the influence of the devil and bamboozle his wife, manipulate and deceive her and cause her to sin. And then she, of course, <clears throat> inveigled him, and he decided to sin with her as well. Okay, so <clears throat> that's the problem there. People not understanding purpose, not understanding the, the divine office in which they were um, are created to function. Right, and we will revisit this at the end of the session. So, I found that I read a book, doctor from a uh, doctor Gary Chapman called uh, Five Love Languages. I read that book some years ago. Powerful, powerful book. And what I found is that even though Doctor Chapman in his book lists five love languages, <clears throat> right. Time spent, gifts given, words of affirmation, physical touch, and acts of service. These are five love languages. What I found in after reading his book and, and observing life on my own, I found that there's really only one love language. There is one fundamental love language, but it is spoken in five different dialects. <laughs> That's how I see it. Five different dialects, right? So time spent is spending quality time with the person that you love. Gifts given, obviously, giving the person gifts that would benefit them. Words of affirmation, speaking positive, uh, affirming words to the individual, physical touch, hugging, kissing, and so forth, right? Acts of service, doing physically, doing things that would be a blessing to that individual. These are the five dialects of the one love language. What is that one love language? The foundation of all love languages is paying self-sacrificial attention. 
that's love that's the, the only love language really is putting your spouse before yourself <laughs> that's it it's as simple as putting that person's needs and desires before your own paying attention to them self-sacrificially denying yourself and elevating that person to a place higher than yourself that's the only love language really okay but it's manifested in five different dialects that's how i see it all right so um the key in the key in um speaking the love language of your spouse is in really again understanding the individual understanding that person you have to study them you have to pay attention to the person and you have to discern what their specific needs are and that's how you can actually effectively speak their particular love language all right now looking at that from a strictly biblical perspective right i found that there are two specific dimensions of love one for the male one for the female two specific dimensions of love from a biblical perspective. Because again, love languages can apply to anyone, saved, unsaved, Christian, non-Christian, young, old, it doesn't matter, right? Everyone has a love language. So for, for, for this purpose, we're going to look at speaking someone's love language from a biblical perspective. And what I've found is that men need unconditional respect. That's the dimension of love that pertains to a man. That's how they interpret love, respect. Women need unconditional security, <laughs> security. And that's how they interpret love, right? Let's break that down and see exactly how that works. The husband needs respect and he interprets respect as love, right? To, for a woman, a wife to practically demonstrate respect to her husband, <clears throat> you want to look at three words, loyalty, trust and counsel okay this is how he will receive uh, uh the uh, practical respect being demonstrated to him loyalty trust and counsel right let's break down each of these words one at a time loyalty is first loyalty can be demonstrated through dependability and faithfulness dependability and faithfulness what does that mean Dependability is your husband goes out there and he is facing the dragons out there, facing the monsters. He goes to work and he is doing battle. <laughs> He's on the battlefield, right? When he comes home, he needs to come home to solace, to comfort. He needs to come home to an environment, an atmosphere where his wounds can be tended to. Because believe it or not, when a demand goes out to work, all right, whether he has his own business, he's working for a company or whatever it is, you know, spiritually speaking, he's really on the battlefield. He is on the battlefield, you see, and he's like a knight in shining armor. And he goes out there to literally face dragons and monsters, right? Demonic spirits attacking him every single day, all day long. You understand? So when he comes home, broken, bloody, bruised from doing battle all day long, guess what? He needs an he needs to enter into an environment that will bless him, that will tend to his wounds, that will um, bring succor, bring comfort to him. You understand? Bring healing to him. That's what he needs. And so that's why he needs dependability and faithfulness from his wife. Right? That's what loyalty looks like. Right. That's what loyalty looks like when he comes home. If he can, if his wife is dependable and faithful and she demonstrates that in a practical way, that brings healing to him. OK. And one of the ways, one of the major ways in which uh, a wife can uh, practically demonstrate faithfulness is through the act of sexual intercourse. Of course. Right. God designed us that way. Right, he designed the female body, designed the male body specifically the way he designed it because of the nature of sex and what sex actually does. Okay, let's look again at the analogy. The man goes out there, knight in shining armor, right? A spiritual attack all day long, suffers all sorts of psychological damage. He comes home, right? When that wife ministers to her husband sexually, okay, what happens is that. When you when you look at the 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 the, the way the bodies are designed and the, the the physical act of intercourse, right? It's like the man is conquering the woman. <laughs> you understand? It's like he's conquering the woman, right? 
even with the sexual positions and all these different things, just the whole psychology of it and the interaction one with another, it's like he's conquering. So the very physical act of physical love between a husband and a wife, that acts as healing to his soul. It acts as healing to his soul, you see? And so it's more than just um, a, a physical pleasure. It's more than just an emotional stimulation. It literally brings psychological and spiritual healing to the man. That's why a sexless marriage is one of the saddest things you could behold on planet Earth. It's very, very sad. Let me explain why. <laughs> According to Ephesians chapter 4, you know, Paul said the marriage of a man and a woman actually represents the, the, the mystical union of Christ and the church, right? His bride, the body of Christ. Now, when you look at it that way, right? The physical man, a physical woman in a marriage represents Christ and believers, Christ and the church. So if that is the case, then what is the correspondence between sex and in the body of Christ? Physical sex between a man and his wife and Christ and the church. What's the correspondence? It's worship. Sex represents worship. You see, because sex is the most intimate interaction between a man and his wife. It is the most intimate interaction. Well, guess what? The most intimate interaction between you and your Lord Jesus Christ is worship. <laughs> you understand? That is what worship is. I call it spiritual intercourse. <laughs> you understand? There are three different types of intercourse. Social intercourse. You go to a party, a wedding, or whatever it is, a banquet, a feast, and you have pleasant conversation with the people there. That's social intercourse. You're interacting in a social way, right? Physical intimacy between a man and his wife, sexual intercourse, right? Worship between the body of Christ, the bride of Christ on earth, and with our husband, Jesus Christ, that worship that spiritual intercourse you see now think about it now a marriage without sex is like a relationship with jesus christ without any worship whatsoever imagine the entire body of christ on earth the bride of christ every christian person on earth and nobody's worshiping jesus no worship what would be the state of that relationship between Christ and his church. It would be virtually non-existent. It's just, it's like a shell. It's there, but there's no substance. There's no juice. You know, as we say in Trinidad, there's no jaw in that relationship. There's no strength, no bond, no intimacy, no nothing that actually matters exists in a worshipless experience with Christ. But guess what? <laughs> in a sexless marriage, that's what you have. <laughs> you are actually roommates. <laughs> you understand? You're roommates, right? You're living as man and wife, but the substance, the, 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 the foundation, the essence, the, the joy, the juice, the marrow, the thing that actually makes it worthwhile is missing. You see? So that is a very, very sad situation to, to, to be in. And I'm saying dependability and faithfulness these are two practical applications uh, when it, in terms of a wife respecting her, her husband, dependability and faithfulness. He needs to know that when he goes out there and he faces the battle out there on the battlefield every day at work, when he comes home, he's coming into an environment that is accepting. He's coming into acceptance, into encouragement, into uh, um, dependability and faithfulness, uh, solace, right? He's coming to a person, uh, his wife, who will tend to uh, heal the psychological wounds that he has experienced out there every day, right? Secondly, belief and encouragement, right? He needs trust. Trust is a vital component in a marriage, right? And trust is broken down into belief and encouragement. A man needs his wife to believe in him, to believe in him when he has a vision to help support that vision. I mean, that's literally the wife's purpose to support the vision of the man, right? And to encourage him right? He doesn't need every time he comes up with an idea that it's shut down, that it's always negative, it's why it cannot be done. Doesn't need that, okay? Um, insight and counterpoint, right? The wife is also to provide counsel to her husband. This is extremely important, and a lot of people don't understand this, right? This is one of the ways a wife can practically submit 
to her husband by providing counsel, wise, godly counsel. And how that looks, she gives insight and counterpoint. Let me break that down for you. A woman, um, God has designed a female brain that a woman is able to access both hemispheres at the same time, right and left hemispheres at the same time. Men cannot do this. We access one hemisphere at a time, either left or right. So you find that men are able to focus more intently on one task for a longer period of time. Detail, very detail conscious. Men can do that, right? One, at one hemisphere of our brain at a time. Women, not so. They can actually access left and right. So they can multitask naturally, easily do, do three, four, five things at the same time and do all well. Men can't do that, right? <laughs> but one of the other benefits of being able to access both left and right hemispheres of the brain, it gives women sort of a second sight, an intuition that men don't have, right? And we hear about female intuition. There's a scientific reason for that. It's not just something that people say. No, women literally see things that men can't see and able, able to grasp things and understand things much deeper, much faster than men can because they can access both hemispheres of their brains at the same time. You understand? So that's the reason why a wife is able to offer insight to her husband that he would not get anywhere else. That is one of the practical reasons why a man ought to listen to his wife, seek counsel from his wife, and listen, really listen. Not just listen to respond, but listen to understand. <laughs> you follow me? And when she gives him insight into something that he disagrees with, he ought to pay attention, not just dismiss it outright, but pay attention to it. Why? Because sometimes she will be able to offer a counterpoint to whatever his perspective is. What does that mean? She will, or she will be able to see the same situation from a totally different perspective. And being able to see it from a different perspective, she could show him it from that new perspective and, and open up his own uh, mental horizons and show him things that he couldn't see before. It was right there, but he was totally blind to it. You understand? So the point is, she may not always agree with what he's saying at that time. She may offer a completely different perspective, something that seems to be opposite to what he's saying, right? When that happens, the wise husband will not immediately dismiss what his wife is saying, but he will pay attention to it and give attendance to it and really try to understand the perspective she's coming from. You understand? Because that is part of her job. Being a submitted wife does not mean doing everything your husband says. That is not submission, not Bible submission. That, that's been a doormat. <laughs> right? And that's what most people think submission is. That's why they reject and rebel against it because they don't understand what submission is. A submitted wife is one who does whatever is necessary to help a husband fulfill the vision that God has given him, the call of God upon his life. And sometimes that means disagreeing with him. Hello. <laughs> The submitted wife, the truly Bible, biblically submitted wife, will disagree with her husband at times because she's wise. <laughs> she's not a fool. She's not an idiot, right? And you are not perfect. So she will see things that you can't see. She will see things from a different perspective that you didn't see. You understand? So the wise husband would listen to his wife, <laughs> right? And pay attention to her perspective and weigh it in the balance. That's wisdom. Right? There's so much more to say in these areas, but I have so much to share with you. I really want to press on. Let's look at a wife, right? So this, this, these are some ways that a wife can show respect to her husband, right? Being dependable, being faithful, right? And let me just touch back on this area of sex, right? Uh, let me tell you something, wives. One of the best things you could do for your husband is to initiate sex, right? Why most women don't do that, I don't know. But initiate sex. Don't wait for him to always be the one to come and ask. And in, and in some cases, beg. <laughs> Your husband should never have to beg you for sex, right? And he shouldn't always have to ask you for sex. Initiate it, right? Whether you feel like it or not, want to or not, he's always in the mood, trust me. <laughs> just give him enough time. Don't just come and spring it on him right now, right? But give him enough time and say, hey, you know, tonight or tomorrow, whatever, you know, and prepare his mind for it. But initiate the thing sometimes. 
your husband will be over the moon. Trust me on that fact, All right? <laughs> so, <clears throat> yes, so um, respect your husband and he will interpret that respect as love, okay? Loyalty, trust, and counsel, right? Broken down into dependability and faithfulness, belief and encouragement, insight and counterpoint. The wife know, okay? A wife <clears throat> needs security. That's what she needs, security. And she will interpret that security as love. That's how it works. Let me let me read something here for you. This is Ephesians chapter four or chapter uh, five, uh, reading from twenty four. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave Himself for it. See, here's the thing: we read that, and many of us. We think or our minds go to him dying on the cross of Calvary, right? And we say, husbands, you have to love your wives as Christ loved the church. How did Christ love the church? He died for her. And we stop right there. I have done that for years. I've done that. And what I got was die for your wife. But here's the thing. There's a reason why Jesus died for the church. He, he didn't just die. There's a reason he died. He died for his bride so that his bride could have eternal security so that she would be certain to go to heaven that's why he died he didn't just die for dying sake there's a reason he died he died so his wife would be eternally secure so that's why i say to you the thing that the wife needs in the marriage relationship more than anything else is a sense of security because that's what christ did for his wife his bride he died so that she would have eternal security. You understand? This is another reason why a born-again Christian cannot lose their salvation. You cannot go to hell. It is impossible. Why? Because that's the whole reason Jesus died. That's the reason he died, to give you the security that and the certainty and assurance that you are going to heaven. He said, you are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. He promised you salvation. Then we gave you the seal to confirm that that promise will come to pass. What does it mean to be sealed with the Holy Ghost? It means the Holy Spirit has entered into your body and merged with your human spirit. And the two spirits have now become one. That's what it means to be sealed with the Holy Spirit. Your human spirit is merged with the Holy Spirit. So there is no one spirit on the inside of you, both human and divine at the same time. That's the sealing. That is a permanent fixture. It can never be extricated. The Holy Spirit cannot be removed from your spirit again. That's not the way it works. He is permanently fused, merged with your spirit. That's why he said, I will never, never leave you nor forsake you. He literally cannot leave you nor forsake you because he's permanently merged. There's one spirit on the inside of every born again Christian, a human and divine spirit at the same time. You're both a lion and a lamb at the same time. You understand? All right. So that is that is that is why Jesus died to give us the security that we are absolutely definitely going to heaven. Well, guess what? In the marriage, that's what your wife needs more than anything else. Security. Security in different areas. Right? She needs spiritual security, mental security, and physical security. And the way you minister to your wife is by standing in and operating in the threefold office of Jesus Christ. Because remember, you represent Christ to your wife and your family. So you have to be prophet, priest, and king in your home. All right? And in being prophet, priest, and king, really, you're just being a good shepherd. You're being the shepherd of your own personal flock, your wife and your kids. That's why the Bible says, if a man cannot take care of his own family at home, then he cannot take care of the house of God. You have to first be a shepherd in your home, your family, your flock. Then when you prove yourself there, then you can now be trusted to shepherd more people, the wider community of Christ. You see? So let's break it down here now. A woman needs security <laughs> instructionally and intercessionally, instructional and intercessional security. How does that work? Well, here's the thing, right? The man has to be a prophet. Prophet is instructional. The prophet under the Old Testament was the person who heard from God and then came to the people and delivered the counsels of God. The prophet heard from God and then delivered God's word to the people in the camp of Israel, right? Even today, generally, that's what a prophet does. Hear some God, and then delivers the word to, to, to God's people. So when you as a husband in your marriage, 
you inhabit and you function in the office of the prophet, you are going to be somebody who is hearing from God and being able to instruct your family, you teach your wife and your children, which means you have to be a student of the word of God. You don't have to be called to be an apostle, prophet, pastor, teacher, evangelist. You just have to be called to be a husband. And that means you need to know the word of God well enough to teach it to your wife and children. You are the prophet in your home, instructional security. She needs to be able to depend on her husband. If she has a, a question about the kingdom of God or life in general, she needs to be able to go to her husband, the first person, the primary person, and get a satisfactory answer from him. And if he doesn't know it at that time, he should be able to tell her, let me go and do some research and then come back and give her the answer. Instructional security. Intercessional security. That is when he inhabits the, the office of the priest. The high priest is the one who heard what the people had to say and then took it to God. You see, the priest and the prophet were in, it's a two-way street. The prophet heard from God and spoke to the people. The priest hears from the people and then speaks to God on their behalf. He represents the people to God. The prophet represents God to the people. So intercessionally now, the man is supposed to be on praying grounds. He's supposed to be an intercessor primarily for his family. <laughs> you understand? You have to be hearing from God and you have to be able to take your family's needs to God, right? And cover your family in intercessory prayer. Amen? That provides a covering and a shield for your family. That's what it does, all right? So... <clears throat> um <laughs> bless God, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> when you are the high priest in your home and you are providing uh intercession, uh intercessory prayer for your family, guess what? When the fiery darts of the enemy come at your family, they're gonna hit you first. <laughs> And this is something that you have to be prepared for, right? And both husband and wives need to understand this, right? I realize that when I look at the marriage situation from a spiritual perspective, I realize something. And it's this. Most, you know, a lot of women think that, um, you know, they're going through hell. <laughs> they're going through hell and their life is so hard and it's so difficult, you know? But here's something that I realized recently. You know, as a wife in a, in, a, in, a, in a marriage, particularly a Christian marriage, whatever it is you're going through, you know, your husband is going through infinitely more than that. And the reason is he's the head of the family. He's the designated head. You understand? So that when the devil is attacking the family, guess who takes the brunt of the attack? Is the person who is out in front. And that's the head, the leader. That's the man. So whatever you are going through as a Christian wife, your husband is going through infinitely more than that you are only experiencing a fraction of the spiritual attack that the devil is sending against your family let me repeat that what however difficult you think your life is and yes some of you women you have an extremely difficult life extremely difficult there's no doubt about it but i'm saying to you Whatever you are experiencing, whatever spiritual attacks that are coming against you, it's a fraction of what your husband is going through. That is an absolute fact. You understand? And this is the reason why he needs to be an intercessor. He needs to stand in the office of high priest in his home so that when he covers his family, himself and his family with prayer, the, 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 the prayer itself, a prayer life will act as a defensive shield, a barrier. And the fiery darts of the enemy will bounce off. They won't be able to hit him, nor hit his wife and children the way they would have hit if he wasn't a man of prayer. So a woman needs to feel security in that area. This is, this is spiritual security we're talking about, right? Instructional and intercessional, right? She needs intellectual security and emotional security as well. She needs to feel intellectual, intellectually secure. What does that mean? How does that work practically? No man, no husband, or to speak to their wife in such a way that you make her feel less than in, from an intellectual perspective. And believe me, brothers and sisters, I'm speaking to myself here more than anybody else because I was and still am guilty of this to a large extent. I'm learning these things. I might be here teaching and preaching, but trust me, I am still in the process of learning how to practically apply these truths to my own life. You understand? So that 
for me in particular, um, you know, I consider myself having a superior intellect. <laughs> that might sound arrogant, right? But it's not. It's just a fact, right? The way God has blessed me, the brain that he has given me, the mind that he has given me, I can see things much easier, abstract things, philosophical things, spiritual things, get revelation, much easier than most other people. It's not me. It's just the gifting of God. It's a gift. You understand? He make me a teacher for a reason. And that's why I'm able to see and discern certain things, all right? The way that my brain operates. So sometimes the way I speak, and I suspect this will be true for many other men, not just myself, the way that we speak to our wives, sometimes we can be condescending. So we don't mean to. We don't mean to. But we have to watch our words. We have to watch our facial expressions, our body language, our tonal quality of what we said. Because here's the thing, and I learned this several years ago. Women don't just hear words. They experience words. They feel words. Women don't hear words. They feel words. They experience words. So if you as a man, you're um, um, verbally abusive and you 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 call your woman, your, your wife, you stupid, you know, why you do this? You know, she doesn't hear you say stupid. She feels stupid. You understand? Women experience words. This is why, from, a, 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 from with a negative example, this is why men who are players, players right they might be handsome they might be you know you know well to do or whatever and they have practiced the art of telling a woman exactly what she wants to hear players right those who use and abuse women they have practiced the art of telling a woman which the reason why they are so good at what they do is that when they speak the right words to the woman the woman experiences what the man is telling her she doesn't just hear these words you see, the rest of her senses might be telling her something is wrong with this guy. You know, this guy is this, this guy is that. Be careful, you know, uh, watch it and, you know, be, be cautious. But when she hears the words that he's saying and he knows how to manipulate and say the right thing in the right time, in the right way, when he knows how to do that, she experiences what he's saying. And that is what traps most women who are victims of players. They experience the words. They feel what the man is saying to them at that time. So if you could infiltrate the mind from that perspective and manipulate her mentally, then you know her lower extremities tend to open up like this. <laughs> so that's a negative example. I am saying to us today, if you are a Christian husband, right, a godly man, learn how to speak to your wife. Learn how to choose the right words. Take your time. You know, don't let your emotions run, you know, run haywire, right? Like, like I do many times. I'm a very passionate, zealous, emotional, expressive individual. This is how I am, you know? And so I, I, I express myself aggressively, right? You have to take that down a notch. You got to take that down. Because even if you don't mean it that way, it could be perceived and received that way. As though you're talking down to people. Again, I'm preaching to myself. You know, because I've heard this so many times over the years. I don't mean it. I don't mean to talk to the people. It's just me, just me being me. But the way it is projected might not be the way it is received. People perceive and receive things differently, right? Because of different reasons. So your, your wife needs to feel intellectually secure. You must never speak to her in such a way that she feels less than, that she feels mentally inferior to you or anybody else intellectually secure, emotionally secure. The two go hand in hand, obviously, right? Because the way you speak to her is the way you would make her feel. So intellectually and emotionally, you must secure your wife, secure her, make her feel comfortable in your presence, right? Don't make her feel that every time you open your mouth, it's an abusive situation going to take place, all right? We, we have to watch that. We have to be extremely mindful of that. And again, when it comes to the man-woman relationship, we have to remember that it's not just the words we speak, it's body language, facial expression, tonal quality, how you say what you say, all right? And this is a thing for, for us men, me in particular, you know, but this is why I said, I said this, you know, oh, I didn't say that. But yeah, you might have said it or didn't say it, but it's how. <laughs> that determines how it's received, how the tonal quality right? And your facial expression and all these things, right? So you have to be mindful of that.
And um, finally, physical and financial security. Your wife needs to feel physically and financially secure. And physical is obvious, all right? She needs to know that you can physically protect her from harm. This is why in those old movies and TV shows and stuff, when you ask the woman, you know, what kind of man you like? Tall, dark, and handsome. <laughs> Tall, dark, and handsome. Right? The handsome is obvious. The dark, I never understood that for many, many years until I got the understanding. This, this whole trope of the tall, dark, and handsome really has to do with white people, mainly white people. So when the woman says tall, dark, and handsome, she means dark, wavy hair and dark eyes. <laughs> That's what they mean by dark, not necessarily a black man. <laughs> when she says tall, dark, and handsome, right, the man is going to be white, but he's going to have dark, wavy hair and dark eyes. And so the contrast of the dark hair and dark eyes in a white face that you know it projects a smoldering sexuality that's why they say dark all right so uh but the first word there in that that trilogy is tall there's a reason why women generally speaking like and prefer tall men why because the man is tall he's big he's strong he's imposing he gives the idea of physical security he can protect her and protect her children that's why women, whether they understand it or not, subconsciously, psychologically, that's why most, and again, I say most, not all, but most women prefer tall men. Why? Because it gives her the idea, the feeling of physical security, both for her and for her kids, right? If you're looking at this man as a husband material, financial security, right? Same thing, believe it or not, right? She wants to be and feel secure, taken care of, not just for her, but for her children, that's why you need to have a job, a business, some sort of consistent, stable income, right? Because the woman needs to feel secure and taken care of in a material, from in a material context, yeah? Not just for herself, but for her children as well. So this is, this, this is, this is what I've, I've found. Men need respect and they interpret respect as love. Woman is security and the interpreted security as love, right? And when you understand your office, your office and the office of your, your spouse, and you're able to operate in that office effectively, then that is what will help to prevent ignorant adultery, right? Somebody elevating their kids in front of their spouse or their mom in front of their spouse or whatever, right? Uh, let's press on. <clears throat> Uh, bless the name of Jesus. James 1.27 says, for pure and holy ministry in your King James Bible, this will say religion, pure religion and undefiled. That is a bad translation. I can tell you that straight up, right? It's a terrible translation. <clears throat> the word here should be ministry or worship. Worship is the best word to fit there. And that's what the word actually means. When you look at the Greek word, it means worship, right? So that actually is the best um, translation for that word, not religion. Pure and holy ministry or worship before God and the Father is this, to take care of orphans and widows and for a man to keep his soul without defilement from the world. Remember, what we're doing here is we're looking at spiritual warfare. And we began by saying that there are three specific enemies that we have to face, the devil, the world, and the flesh. All right? And in this particular area here, we are focusing mainly on the world. The devil, yes, because demons are in, in, in all of this that we're talking here. The, the, the devil is going to have a hand in all this to wreck marriages and so forth, right? But primarily, we are talking about the world. What is the world? The systems and culture of human society. And how does the world become an enemy to you? How does a world, the world attack us? Through devilish doctrines, through ideologies, through beliefs, right? What we think, thoughts, what we practice right? The fundamental ideology or philosophy of life or mental paradigm, okay? Doctrines of devils. That's how the world attacks. So I am trying to show you from a biblical perspective how we should think and how we should conduct our lives to combat what the world is projecting at us at all times. The education system, entertainment system, and all these systems, they all have a message. They're preaching a message to us. And that message is one of negativity, evil, darkness. They want us to think like how the devil thinks. Okay, And we have to take, um, take stock as to what we think and, and really guard our heart, guard our minds, all right? And um, think like how God wants us to think. Okay. All right. Let's bring this in for a landing. 
right? And um, I have a lot of um, reading and stuff here. I know I won't be able to get through all this reading. So I'm going to go through all these pages. So it will be up there, present in the video for you to go and look at after. And I'm going to try to, I'm going to try to, um, paraphrase as much as, as as possible but what i want to what i want to look at here now is this remember we began this teaching with talking about offices and understanding the office and respecting the office i want to show you examples to learn from both negative and positive all right of people who did not discern the office of someone else or those who did discern the office of someone else and the reason i want to go into this is this see when you talk about a wife respecting her husband, one of the reasons why you find that there will be disrespect in a marriage, both sides, eh? both the husband not understanding the office of the, the wife and the wife not uh, respecting the husband. The reason is, it's very difficult for... But let me let me start by saying this. There is a statement: familiarity breeds contempt. <laughs> Let's begin there. Familiarity breeds contempt, right? Um, and this is true. And this is the thing that sort of infiltrates marriages and brings about the breakdown of marriages because familiarity breeds contempt, right? All right. Let's read Matthew 13, 54 to 58. He, that's Jesus, returned to Nazareth, his hometown. When he taught there in the synagogue, everyone was amazed and said, where does he get this wisdom and the power to do miracles? Then they scoffed. He's just the carpenter's son. And we know Mary, his mother and his brothers, James, Joseph, Simon and Judas. All the sisters live here, right here among us. Where did he learn all these things? And they were deeply offended and refused to believe in him. Then Jesus told them, a prophet is honored everywhere, except in his own home tongue and among his own family. And so he did only a few miracles there because of their unbelief. Understand this, God was in their midst in a human form. Cause they knew Jesus after the flesh as Joseph's son, the carpenter, or Mary's boy child, or Joseph and Simon's brother. That's how they knew him. See, they were familiar with him because he grew up in their neighborhood. They know him a little boy running down the road, you know, <laughs> you know, with his father, you know, knocking and, and building cupboards and whatnot. They knew him. They were familiar with him from a natural perspective. And so that familiarity bred contempt. They scoffed at him. When he grew up, became a man, and he started to enter into his office and operate as a prophet of God. They did not discern the office in which he occupied because they didn't discern it, they didn't respect it, they didn't appreciate it, and they did not receive the blessings from the prophet of God. See all that's what they said here, right? About how familiar they were and how they were discoffed and they, they were offended and so forth. Here's how Jesus responded. After they said all of this, Jesus said, a prophet is honored everywhere except in his own hometown among his own family. Jesus brought it back to the office in which he stood. He didn't try to defend himself and say, no, nothing but being a carpenter or Joseph or Mary or that a prophet is not. So Jesus brought it right back to where their mind should have been, recognizing that this is a prophet sent from God and receive him as a prophet. If they did that, he would be able to create a lot of miracles in their area, bless a lot of families. He was not able to do that. And this is powerful because when a woman, a wife, looks at her husband and all she sees is this young boy that she grew up with, no one another since they were 16, 17 years old, went to school together or they met in the youth choir in church or they, were, they lived in the same neighborhood or whatever the situation was. And she, you know, when she, when she deals with her husband and that's what she sees, she remembers this boy that she knew. You know, and she's intimately familiar with all his flaws, all his failings, all his shortcomings. And she begins to deal with him from that perspective. And it becomes a habit, a mindset in her mind that this is the person that she's dealing with. This is the person I have to deal with. And all the negativity is uppermost in her mind. And it becomes ingrained 
it becomes a stronghold in her mind that she cannot see that this is a prophet, a priest, and a king in my home. She doesn't understand, she doesn't discern the office that this man is standing in. If that's the case, and she cannot discern the office, then she will fall into the exact same condemnation of these people in Jesus' tongue. God was in their midst, and he, he was forbidden. He couldn't. They stopped him from doing miracles because they had a bad attitude toward him. They had a wrong perspective toward him. They didn't see him in the office that he stood in. So the anointing of the office could not bless them. Christian wife, when all you see in your husband is the man, the boy, the, the young man, the boy, the man that you know you're familiar with and all his failings and shortcomings, and you don't discern, respect, and appreciate the office that he stands in, the prophet, the priest, and the king in your home, in your marriage, in your family, then you, you, not the man, you, stop the anointing from flowing through God, from God, through him to you. When you have the wrong perspective in your marriage and you don't see your husband as the prophet, priest, and king, and so this has nothing to do with whether he's acting as prophet, priest, or king. Because I know some of your minds are going right there. I'm talking to you, Christian wives. <laughs> right? When you look at your husband, and all you see is that person, you see him after the flesh, then that, that, that's what you will receive from it. That's how faith operates. Faith operates like that. It unlocks things from the spirit realm and draws it to you like a magnet. Your faith is what, listen to me. See, this is the thing that a lot of Christian wives don't understand. When you're talking about submission, you're talking about how you ought to respond to your husband. You, to a very large extent, determines what kind of marriage you have. You determine that to a large extent. I'm not saying everything bad is the wife's fault and the husband is an angel. That's not what I'm saying. I'm trying to show perspective. It goes both ways, by the way, right? We'll deal with the husband after, but from the, we're dealing with the wife now. Depending on how you see your husband, you can either unlock a floodgate of the prophetic, priestly, and kingly anointing on that man's life to bless you until you can't stand the blessing. You have the power to do that simply by your perspective and how you choose to respond and react to your husband. You can do that. You can release the anointing from God through him onto you and your children. You have that choice. You have that ability to do that. Or you can stop that anointing from flowing. Just as how these people here stop God from being God in their lives. They scoffed. They were offended. They had unbelief. And they stopped God from being God. You understand? Don't do that. <laughs> Don't do that. Right? John 7, 5. Even his brothers didn't believe in him. Right, Mark 3, 21 and 22. When his family heard about this, we're still talking about Jesus. When his family heard about this, they went out to take custody of him, saying he is out of his mind. Family thought he was crazy. Right, The scribes who had come down from Jerusalem were saying he's possessed by Beelzebub and by the prince of demons, he drives out demons. So the unsafe people thought he was demon possessed and his own brothers and sisters thought he was mad. Right, And so the people in his community in Nazareth, they couldn't receive anything from Jesus. <clears throat> right, I want to beg you to be patient with me. We're going to go a little bit over the hour, right? but I wanna, I'm going to go through this as quickly as I can. Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. Right, And again, um, I want to try to paraphrase as much as possible. Miriam and Aaron speak against Moses, and the Lord heard it. What they were saying is, <clears throat> had the Lord indeed spoken only by Moses? Had he not spoken by us as well? <laughs> so Miriam and Aaron were Moses' big brother and big sister, right? In case I didn't know, right? Aaron was three years older than, than Moses and Miriam was much older. This is the same Miriam who, when Moses was a little baby in the basket floating down the river Nile, she was the one running down the bank, making sure the crocodiles didn't eat him, right? She was the one who had his life in her hands, 
when Pharaoh's daughter came and took up the basket with Moses, she's the one, Miriam, who went and orchestrated everything, right? So now they are big, you know, grown up adults and Moses is this mighty man of God and he, you know, has all this power and whatnot and they feeling left out. This is their little brother, <laughs> you know, and big brother and big sis, they feeling like, hey, well, you know, so we are prophets too. God could speak to us too. <laughs> and they began to speak against the man of God. But here's what the Bible says. The Bible says, now the man Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. He was the meekest person on planet earth. You know why the Bible can say that? Because he, at that time, he was the most powerful man on planet earth. This is the man who stood up to Pharaoh, who basically uh, the Egyptian empire was one of the greatest empires on the planet at that time. And Moses stood up to him and defeated him. Mash up his whole structure. Because Pharaoh and all his people drunk. Because who? The man Moses. So in essence, Moses was the most powerful human being on the planet at that, at that time. And because he was the most powerful and yet still he was the most humble, that translated into meekness. Meekness is what? Power under control. Power under control. Right? So the point is, Miriam and Aaron started to speak against him. And God heard it. And God came on the scene. And God called the three of them. And basically... <clears throat> Here's what God said to them. Hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision and will speak unto him in a dream. My servant Moses is not so, who is faithful in all mine house. With him, I will speak mouth to mouth. Or in other words, face to face, right? And not in dark speeches. And he goes on. The Lord said, um, wherefore then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses, <laughs> right? And um, bottom line is that Miriam was struck with leprosy. So <clears throat> Miriam and Aaron did not discern the office. When they looked at Moses, all they saw was their little brother. That's what they saw. And they began to speak about him as though he was their little brother, not discerning that this was a prophet of God, anointed of God, the most powerful man on the planet at that time, okay? And after Miriam was struck with leprosy, here's what Aaron said. Aaron said unto Moses, Alas, my Lord, I beseech thee. <laughs> this is the same one who was opening his mouth a while ago and talking about, had not God spoken by us as well? We are prophets just like Moses. He, he, he boiled down like Baji. My Lord, I beseech thee, lay not the sin upon us, wherein we have done foolishly and wherein we have sinned. <laughs> You understand? And so it went on and on. And basically, uh, Moses had to pray that uh, Miriam uh, be healed. And God said, listen, I will heal her, but she's seven days. She's going to be without the camp and she's going to have leprosy for seven days. Right. And God said something strange. He said, if her father had spit in her face, should she not be ashamed at least seven days? That's how God looked at Miriam, the big sister, talking about her little brother. Why did God look at it like that? As if her father spit in her face and she was ashamed for seven days because she did not discern the office, the office in which her brother stood. All right? Let's press on. David and Michael. <clears throat> Second Samuel 6, 20 to 21. David had just brought the ark back into the Jerusalem and he was dancing before the Lord in the spirit and worshiping God. And his uh, wife, Michael, who was Saul's daughter, she, um, she didn't like that at all. Okay, so this is what she said. When David returned home to bless his own family, Michael, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet him. And she said in disgust, disgust, how distinguished the king of Israel looked today, shamelessly exposing himself to the servant girls like any vulgar person might do. Hmm. David retorted to Michael, I was dancing before the Lord who chose me above your father and all his family. He appointed me as leader of Israel, the people of the Lord. So I celebrate before the Lord. Therefore, Michael, the daughter of Saul, had no children to the day of her death. She was cursed with barrenness. Quick insight into this. How could she look at David, the king of Israel, and speak to him like this? Because she was his wife. She, she accustomed to seeing him naked. <laughs> he might be king of Israel to everybody else, but this was she husband. You understand? 
they 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 you know have marital relationships. So she's seen him in every different you know condition and position. She regularly seen naked. So she allowed familiarity to breed contempt. <clears throat> Bring it back home now to us, husbands and wives. Again, Christian wives, you see a husband in every condition imaginable, right? And you see him all how, okay? When you are dealing with your husband, please, please, please maintain that this is the prophet, priest, and king over this little vineyard here. You understand? Over this garden, this little garden of Eden, right? This is the prophet, priest, and king. This is the shepherd over this flock. And deal with your husband with that level of respect. Okay, do not fall under the condemnation of Michael. To be barren was a curse. She was like a pariah outside of society. It was the worst thing beside leprosy is to be barren. Okay, so Miriam was, was cursed with, because Miriam wasn't married apparently. She was cursed with leprosy. Michael was cursed with barrenness. Don't let that happen to you. David, Abigail, and Nabal, right? Let's get you this as quickly as possible. There was a man named Nabal, right? His, his name actually means fool or foolish. That, that gives you an idea of the kind of person he was. But he was married to a woman named Abigail, right? And um, the Bible says she was an intelligent and beautiful woman. Intelligent and beautiful. But her husband was surly and mean. All right. So this is the situation here. This man was very wealthy. He had flocks and whatnot. And David at this point was not yet king. Right, he was running from Saul. So David had a band of men around him, a couple hundred men, and they were out in the wilderness running from King Saul. And the point is, when neighbors' servants came with their flocks and the herd and the sheep and whatnot, David and his mighty men, they would protect them and make sure nobody interfered with them. This went on for a long time. So now David, of course, didn't have any substance. He wasn't king yet. You know, they were hungry. They were on the run. So at this point, he sent messengers, some of his men, to Nabal to, to respectfully request that Nabal help them by sending some food and whatnot and provision. And Nabal insulted David's men. He dealt with them harshly and, I mean, really, really bad and insulted them and sent them back. Okay, when David heard that, David got 400 of his men and he began to ride toward Nabal. His intention was to slaughter Nabal and every man in his household. He's going to kill every last one of them. Thank God for Abigail, right? One of the servants came to Abigail, uh, which is Nabal's wife, and told her what David was about to do. So we pick up the story here in verse 18. Abigail acted quickly. She took 200 loaves of bread, two skins of wine, five dressed sheep, five shares of roasted grain, a hundred cakes, and many more stuff. And she basically sent these ahead toward uh, David to meet him with her servants, right? And then she came afterward. As she came riding her donkey into the mountain ravine where there were David and his men descending toward her, and she met them. No, David had just said, it's been useless, all my watching over this fellow's property in the wilderness so that nothing of his was missing. He has paid me back evil for good. So David was intent on murder, right? Here's what he said. May God deal with David, be it ever so severely, if by morning I leave alive one male of all who belong to him. David is going to kill this man and everybody with him. When Abigail saw David, she quickly got off her donkey, bowed down before David with her face to the ground. This is not her husband. This is David. David wasn't king as yet. Right? He was just somebody running out in the wilderness there with, with people running for his life, scared, you understand, running from King Saul. Right? She left her husband, came to meet David, sent all his food to him, and she's now bowing down to the ground in front of David. Here's what the woman says. Listen carefully. She fell at his feet and said, pardon your servant, my lord, and let me speak to you. Hear what your servant has to say. Please pay no attention, my lord, to that wicked man, Nabal. That's her husband. He is just like his name. His name means fool, and folly goes with him. And as for me, your servant, I did not see the men my lord sent. And now, my lord, as surely as the lord your god lives, and as you live, since the lord has kept you from bloodshed, and from avenging yourselves with your own hands, may your enemies and all who are intent on harming my Lord be like Nabal. And let this gift which your servant has brought to my Lord be given to the men who follow you. Please forgive your servant's presumption. 
the Lord your God will certainly make a lasting dynasty for my Lord. She's still talking to David. Because you fight the Lord's battles and no wrongdoing will be found in you as long as you live. Even though someone is pursuing you to take your life, the life of my Lord will be bound securely in the bundle of the living by the Lord your God. But the lives of your enemies, he will hurt hurl away as from the pocket of a sling. When the Lord has fulfilled for my Lord every good thing he promised concerning him and has appointed him a ruler over Israel. The woman prophesying now. My Lord will not have on his conscience the staggering burden of needless bloodshed or, or of having avenged himself. And when the Lord your God has brought my Lord success, remember your servant. The Bible said this woman was intelligent. It's evident this woman was not just intelligent, she was wise. All right? David said to Abigail, praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, who has sent you today to meet me. May you be blessed for your good judgment and for keeping me from bloodshed this day and from avenging myself with my own hands. Right? And it's, it goes on and on and on. Now, here's the thing. Several days later, <clears throat> right, um, she, uh, that night, uh, when she went, the neighbor, the, the fool, her husband, he was celebrating and whatnot, and he was drunk. The next day when he was sober, she told him what was about to happen to him that night. Right? This here in verse 37. Then in the morning when Nabal was sober, his wife told him all these things, and his heart failed him, and he became like stone. About 10 days later, the Lord struck Nabal, and he died. Couple of things I want to, to, to notice here. One. Nabal clearly did not respect the office of his wife because she knew him to be a fool. This was an ongoing thing, right? So he, like how Michael didn't respect the office of her husband, David, Nabal didn't respect the office of his wife. His wife was intelligent and beautiful, right? She was a woman of wisdom. Not only that, she was, she was wise, she was humble, she was discerning. She was, the woman was a gem. This is the Proverbs 31 woman right here. This woman, Abigail, an amazing, amazing wife. And this man is a fool. He's not respecting and deserting and appreciating the office of his wife. Remember, I said one of the things that the husband has to do is to receive the wife's counsel, receive her insight, receive even if it's a counterpoint. You understand? Even when she disagrees with him, sometimes it's for his own good. This is a perfect example of that. Right? This is not a woman being disrespectful to her husband and going behind his back and doing something he said not to do. That's not this. It's actually the opposite. By Nabal being insulting to David and not giving him the food and the provisions he asked for, he was out the will of God. He was outside the will of God. That was an evil thing that he was doing because David and his men put their lives at risk to protect Nabal's property. You, you understand what I'm saying? So Nabal was wrong. And what his wife did know, right, by going behind his back and going to David and giving him all this food, she was being righteous. She was being wise. She was being submitted. That is what submission looks like. I told you before, a submitted wife does not always agree with her husband. If the husband is wrong, he's on the wrong side of the wisdom of God, the wrong side of the judgment of God. Then if the woman is doing the opposite, she's actually in submission where he is not. I wonder if you understood what I just said. I am saying to you that a submitted wife from the Bible, from a biblical perspective, a wife who is submitted to her husband doesn't always agree with him. If he is wrong, clearly wrong, and he's on the wrong side of God, sometimes the wisdom of God will have her to act contrary to what he is saying or doing at that time. And she's the one who will be justified, not him. Submission for a wife is helping the husband to fulfill the, the will of God and the plan of God for his life. So if he's outside the will and plan of God, sometimes she has to disagree with him by word or by action. But again, it must be done respectfully, all right? In the, in the long, long and short of this year, what happened is that Nabal died and then David sent for Abigail and she became his wife, okay? N Nabal didn't, didn't discern the office of his wife, but Abigail discerned the office of David. She did exactly the opposite of what Michael, David's wife, did not do. 
and that was Michael, his actual wife. This was Abigail. This wasn't David's wife. This was just some woman in Israel. But she had the wisdom, the insight, the revelation, the discernment to see where God was taking David and what was going to be with him because he still, he wasn't king yet. He was just in the wilderness running for his life. But she pronounced all these blessings upon him and declared the counsels of God. You understand? So she clearly discerned the office that David would have occupied as king of Israel. And she began to deal with him from that perspective. Again, we can learn so much here. David at this point in time was not yet king, but Abigail dealt with him as though he were already king. How many Christian wives, if they would only treat their husband like a king, he would eventually grow into the king that you want him to be. I'm talking to you about the power of submission in a marriage. Walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, your husband laps in. Yes, the man has so many faults, it can fill a, 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 an encyclopedia. Yes, the man is not being the leader God called him to be. But for heaven's sakes, help the man to become the leader. Stop dealing with him as he is and start dealing with him as you want him to be. Then he shall. <clears throat> Am I saying everything is on the wife and the husband could just be lapsed and like a day single and just do what he wants? That's not what I'm saying. I'm trying to show you perspective. You can choose to deal with the man as he is right now, weak, failing, faulty. And guess what? He will continue to be that way. If you choose to, because this is the power that you have. This is the office that you have. Remember the meaning of help meet. That would help. That Hebrew word is divine help in a human package. The word translated help in help meet is always use of God's divine help to mankind. So when God gave Eve to Adam, God gave Adam himself in a female body. Divine help. A Christian wife has power, all wives, but more so Christian wives, have power, untapped power to literally transform their husbands into the image that they want him to have, into the prophet, into the priest, and into the king that they want to see in their marriage. You have that power. Do take my word for it. Behold, Smith and Polly Wigglesworth, and we, 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 we're bringing this in for a landing. Bear with me. Smith and Polly Wigglesworth, right? Polly is a nickname. Her name, when he met her when they were young, was um, Mary Jane Featherstone, Okay. She was part of the Salvation Army. This was in the 1800s. She was preaching and, and doing the will of God. All right. He had a, a conversion from an early age uh, into Christianity and uh, they met and whatnot. But at one point in time, he became backslidden, terribly backslidden. backslidden right. And um, I, I read this, this uh, testimony many years ago. <sighs> They were living in England. It was the middle of winter and it was snowing. It's very cold, bitterly cold. And she, Polly, dressed for church. He was backslidden as a Christian and he forbade, he was so terribly backslidden, he forbade her from going to church. He says, you cannot go. He was being used by the devil. She said, Smith, I love you. You're my husband and I'm submitted to you. But my Lord, Jesus Christ, commands me to not forsake the assembling of myself. Therefore, I'm going to church. He said, if you leave, if you walk out that door, I'm going to lock it. And you're not stepping back foot inside of this house tonight. She kissed him after she had prepared his dinner, by the way. <laughs> right? And told him, this is your dinner. She kissed him and said, have a good night. She went to church. Came back from church. The door was locked. Man of his wood, door was locked. Snowing outside, bitter cold. Polly bundled herself together, pulled her clothes, sat down right by the door and prayed a simple prayer. Lord, preserve and protect me, preserve, preserve and protect me tonight. And she slept right there in the cold. God faithful protected her. She didn't freeze to death. In the morning when Smith Wigglesworth got up and opened the door, she just fell inside. <laughs> She fell inside. 
She sprang up. She kissed him sweetly. Good morning, Smith. And she went to prepare his breakfast. When that happened, when that happened, the conviction that hit this man radically transformed his life. The conviction that hit him radically changed him. And then he began to become the man of God that we know him today. In case you don't know who Smith Wigglesworth is, they call him the apostle of faith. You understand? He is a powerful, powerful preacher of the gospel. And this was the turning point in his life. One of the turning points in his life. Let's read. Smith Wigglesworth would pray and the blind would see. The deaf were healed. People came out of wheelchairs and cancers were destroyed. One remarkable story is when he prayed for a woman in a hospital. While he and a friend were praying, she died. Praying for a sick woman and she died while they prayed for her. He took her out of the bed, stood her against the wall and said, In the name of Jesus, I rebuke this death. Her whole body began to tremble. Then he said, In the name of Jesus, walk. <laughs> And she walked. The woman came back to life. Everywhere he would go, he would teach and then he would show the power of God. He began to receive requests from all over the world. He taught in Europe, Asia, New Zealand, many other areas. When the crowds became very large, he began a wholesale healing. He would have everyone who needed healing lay hands on themselves. Then he would pray. Hundreds would be healed at one time. Over Smith's ministry, it was confirmed that 14 people were raised from the dead. Jesus said, the works that I do, greater work shall you do. Jesus made three, raised three people from the dead. Smith Wigglesworth raised 14 people from the dead. Thousands were saved and healed, and he impacted the whole continents for Christ. Read this man's testimony when you get a chance. Right? At one point, he wasn't filled, and then he got filled with the Holy Spirit, and his, his ministry took off in, in a whole different area. But the thing that actually impacted his life the most and set him on this path to be one of the most powerful preachers of the gospel and one of the most powerful miracle workers is the experience he had with his wife. She was submitted to him. In her submission to him, she defied his orders and did the opposite of what he commanded her to do. Do you understand that? He told her, don't go to church. She said, I respect you, you're my husband, but my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ commands me. You understand? So I'm going to church. When she did that, she was being faithful to the marriage covenant. She was helping him to fulfill his vision, the call of God upon his life, by her defying his orders. Do you understand what I've been trying to say to you all this time? True biblical submission does not mean agreeing with everything your husband says or does. Sometimes you have to bring counterpoint. You have to bring a different insight to the conversation. Like Abigail, sometimes you have to go and do what he says not to do or act contrary to what he is doing. That's true submission because the submission of a wife to her husband is actually being submission to the vision that God gave him. As long as if she didn't go to church that night and stayed with him, he would have stayed backslidden and not fulfilled the call of God upon his life. Therefore, she would not have been the help meet that he needed her to be. Do you get it? So by her doing something that seemed to be rebellious, she was actually submitted to him. And I, I, I want to stress this. <clears throat> Most women, even men, men and women, they don't understand biblical submission. And that's the reason why many people rebel against it. Women in particular, Christian wives rebel against it because they don't understand what biblical submission is. All right. I wish I had so much more time to go into a whole lot more. I don't. I'm already taxing you on your time. Right. This is the last panel. I just want to read through this quickly and then we'll end. The Proverbs 31 woman is a wife and mother. I want to show you what a submitted, the life of a submitted woman. I want to show you the possibility of what a submitted life could look like. For those women who think submission means weakness, it means being taken advantage of. It's, it's a negative word, a bad word, you know, and it, it's, it's abuse. It's akin to abuse. That's the concept most women have of submission. 
I want to show you what biblical submission actually looks like. We saw it in Abigail. We saw it again in Polly Wiggleswood. I'm going to show you from the Bible straight up what a submitted woman, what her life could look like. Proverbs 31 from verse 10 to verse 29. A wife of noble character, who can find? She's worth far more than rubies. Her husband has full confidence in her and lacks nothing of value. She brings him good, not harm, all the days of her life. She selects wool and flax and works with eager hands. She is like the merchant ships bringing her food from afar. She's into import and export, this woman, this Proverbs 31 woman. She's a businesswoman, right? It's like a merchant ship bringing her goods from afar. She gets up while it is still at night. She provides food for her family and portions for her female servants. The woman is an employer. She has employees under her. This is a submitted wife. This is what a Christian wife looks like, okay? She's a woman... Who and the, the Bible doesn't say you know call put all these titles on her. I am putting these titles on her. The Bible doesn't. The Bible is just describing a virtuous wife. That's all. <laughs> a woman who is just a wife and a mother. Nothing else. That's all the Bible is describing. But I am showing you insight as to what the life of a virtuous woman, a true, uh, biblically submitted wife, could actually look like. She considers a field and buys it. She's a real estate tycoon. Out of her earnings, she plants a vineyard. She's an agriculturalist. She sets about her work vigorously. Her arms are strong for her tasks. She finds time to go to the gym and works out. She's fit and strong. <laughs> she sees her trading is profitable. She has educated herself and understands how the stock market works. And she has investments out there because her trading is profitable. And her lamb does not go out at night. In her hand, she holds the distaff and grasps the spindle with her fingers. These are implements for sewing, right? For, for garments and whatnot. So the woman is a fashion designer. She's a seamstress. She's a fashion designer. She opens her arms to the poor. She's a philanthropist and extends her hands to the needy. When it snows, she has no fear for her household, for all of them are clothed in scarlet, right? She's conscientious and takes care of her household. She makes coverings for her bed. She's clothed in fine linen and purple. Her husband is respected at the city gate where he takes his seat among the elders of the land. See, because she is all of these things, she is freeing up his time to become the, the best that he could possibly be. She is helping him fulfill his potential. Do you understand? She makes linen garments and sells them, right? She was Gucci before Gucci existed and supplies the merchants with sashes, uh, sashes. She is clothed with strength and dignity. She can laugh at the days to come. She's a woman of vision, a woman of faith, a woman of insight and foresight. Right? She speaks with wisdom and faithful instruction is on her tongue. She's a motivational speaker. Glory to God. She watches over the affairs of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children arise, call her blessed. Her husband also, he praises her. Many women do noble things, but you surpass them all. Look at how many different hats this woman is wearing. Modern feminism would try to sell you a bag of lies and tell you that you have to forsake your husband, forsake your children, leave them with a babysitter, and go out into the world and become the CEO of this company, become a social media influencer, become this, become that, become the other, and abandon your husband and children in order to fulfill all these things. This woman is doing more than most feminists today. She's occupying more offices, hold more, more, wearing more hats. She's more profitable and richer and wealthier than most of these people. She has servants under her. She has employees. She's an entrepreneur. She's, she's a titan of industry. She's all these things within the context of still only being a wife and a mother. She never left her primary purpose, her primary office of being a wife and mother. 
but yet still she's fulfilling all the dynamic potential that God has placed inside of her. All the giftings, the characteristics and the qualities that makes her a champion, a victor. Glory to God. She's experiencing the fullness of the potential that God has endued her with, still only being a wife and a mother, submitted to her husband, blessing her children, and her children and her husband, blessing her in return. You have been sold a bag of lies. Wife, submission is not a bad thing. When you do it right, when you do it biblically, you can fulfill your greatest destiny in Christ Jesus.